بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على أفضل المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه الطيبين الطاهرين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي وبعد جزاكم الله خير for coming again to the class always my pleasure to be with you uh, والله my honor to speak about this topic as I always say it's one that changed my own life and I hope that it's as I always remind us this is not about the historical events and uh, feeling good about, you know, Salah al-Din, it's much deeper than that, right? It's lessons for us. What happened? How did the Ummah change? What can I take from this, right? This is what, what we're trying to discuss in this class. And I remind you again that the name of the class is not Salah al-Din, it's what? The generation of Salah al-Din al-Ayubi. It's not just a single man's show, right? And that's a question we always ask ourselves, the light of the current events of what's going on right now. And subhanAllah, it has been interesting. The last 10 years, whenever I teach this class, something happens in the Middle East. <laughs> it's like, I don't know what's going on. <clears throat> but I remind you, just a quick reminder, dua. We stopped actually in that, if you remember last time, we stopped at some uh, incident that we said Nur al-Din Zinki was actually uh, defeated in one of the battles. And when people told him, take, take money from the scholars, take money from people of knowledge that are sitting in the masajid, we need, we need money for the army so that we can defend, you know, defend the Muslims. Do you remember his response? His response was something very interesting. He said, do you want me to take money from people that fight for me day and night with arrows that never miss and give it to you? You don't fight except when I'm with you and you hit and you miss. Their dua is the arrows that never miss. And then he quoted the hadith. هَلْ تُنْصَرُونَ أَوْ تُرْزَقُونَ إِلَّا بِدُعَفَائِكُمْ Do you get victory? or provision, except by the dua of the ones that you deem weak, the righteous. So do not underestimate the power of dua. And it is sad to like, if, if what's happening is happening and I can't even make dua, that says a lot about me, right? And as we speak about this class, remember, those scholars told something really interesting. I know it's a small reflection, but I just want to say it because it's very relevant. Whenever things happen in the life of this world, as a seeker of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know what I look at? What is my ubudiyah in that situation? Anything that things happen around us, certain things makes us happy, things makes us sad, things are hard, things are easy, like waves in the sea, you know, when you're in, things come on us. A believer is always interested in what? My reaction to the things that happen. It's not about what comes to me, it's about how do I react to it. I always look on that. Do I, am I content being one of the spectators sitting in front of Al Jazeera and CNN and cheering up when something good happens and crying when something bad happens and that's my role? Is that it? Sometimes good things happen and it can be bad for me. I miss out on, on good opportunities. And sometimes the opposite. Bad things happen and it was the best thing for me because I decided to do something about it. Right? So please remember this. We, I warn all of us because we live in the days of the internet and do not become a spectator. Do not just please sit and watch. And then when you ask how long was your dua? One minute. How long did you spend on Al Jazeera? Three hours. There is a problem right there, right? And at the end, I'll tell you some action items that I think we can do, inshallah. Khair. So let's start, inshallah, the class. So uh, last time we stopped, last time was the change of tide, if you remember. We spoke about how things changed. We spoke about uh, the appearance of Nur din Zinki, the son of Imad din Zinki, if you remember. And we said this is, this is a new generation raised by the scholars of the time. And we said Nur din Zinki had a very clear vision. Unlike his dad, he was popular with the soldiers, but he was also popular with the scholars. He was a scholar himself. He was a scholar of hadith. One of the very first things that, that he did when he started this effort against the crusaders was he asked, Al-Hafid ibn Asakir, the great hadith scholar of the time, write a book, Al-Arba'ina fil Jihad. You know the 40 hadith Nawawi? You know, like the, uh, yani, uh, people in, back in the day, if you want to memorize 40 hadith for, uh, from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, right, what would they be? So Imam Nawawi has the 40 Nawawi hadith. In his time, he said, well, I'm about to embark on an effort against the crusaders, right? Which is fighting in the way of Allah. I need a book. And that book should be simple enough that everybody memorizes and knows it. So please, he told the Hafid ibn Asakir, write uh, the 40 hadith about the ethics and the, uh, and the uh, conduct about how to fight for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Tells you about Nuruddin Zinki. 
He built lots of schools. It was a major reform, right? We said of the things he did, he banned wine from his army. And yes, Muslims used to drink wine before him. He's the one that abolished that, right? Established schools, right? Abolished all taxes in his kingdom, which was a major thing, right? Uh, was very keen on uh, bringing scholars close by, uh, putting schools. And we said he uh, two things. One, that one nation. It's, it's, no, it's not nationalism. It's not I'm a Kurd and you're an Arab and you're a Turk. One nation. We're all Muslims. So one banner. The banner of La ilaha illallah. The rule is the Sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The cause of fighting the Crusaders is not the cause of the, the Palestinians. It's not the cause of the, the, the Arabs. This belongs to the Muslim world. Jerusalem, Al-Quds, is central to any Muslim. I don't know or I don't care where you come from. This is something that touches all of us. So he brought a new ideology. We unite. And we don't unite about uh, our, our ethical origin or, you know, our nationalistic. No, 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 no. It's not about being Egyptian, Syrian, Jordanian, Iraqi. No. It's about la ilaha illallah. So he made that very clear. So that was one of the, uh, his major things. The second, internal reform. The ummah continues, needs to be established from inside the infrastructure, if you will. And he spent a lot of deal of effort on doing that. Uh, last time we stopped, uh, we said how Nur al-Din Zinki, one of his major achievements was what? He succeeded in uniting Sham. For the first time, the three major cities, Al-Mawsil, Alipu, and Damascus, was under his control. And we said the way he took Damascus, I'm reminding you, was not by fighting, was through scholars. He won the heart of people. He was, so, he was so admired by people. He was so kind. He was so admired by scholars that really he got Damascus, as we described last time, without shedding a single drop through the scholars of the time. So one of the things that Nur al-Din Zinki had, he was, had a very strong uh, affiliation with scholars. Any city, the scholars of that city, he knows them. He sends to them. He takes their opinion. So one of his soldiers, if you will, were the scholars of every single town, as we will see today, inshallah. Type. We stopped, we said, uh, so Sham seems to be in a good condition. Nuruddin Zinke was doing well. And we stopped that in some battles, he was actually defeated in one of the battles. Nevertheless, his resolve, he was unwavering, right? But we stopped at the following. The Crusaders started to realize, the Franks, that the area of Sham now is under a very powerful ruler. What about Egypt? And we said at that point, if for the last 20, 30 years, Egypt was not to be mentioned. What was going on? The e Egypt was under the Ismaili Khilafah, as we discussed before, the Ismaili Khalifa in Cairo. And Egypt was continuously declining. Economy was terrible. Uh, almost civil war. There was a new wazir every two, three months. You know, a wazir would come to power. Another guy would come lynch him and take control. He comes to power. Uh, he gets assassinated. Every two, three months, you have a new wazir in Egypt, right? And the country was falling, and it was becoming so weak. And the Franks, the Crusaders, started to realize Egypt is one of the biggest countries in the region. If we take Egypt, it's a treasure, right? And Nur al-Din Zinki started to realize that, that Egypt is a, threat, is a threat. If it falls to the Crusaders, it's bad. Especially that they took the city of Asqalan, which is very close to the Egyptian border, right? Asqalan that you see right now doesn't belong to the Muslims anymore, right? It used to belong to the Muslims, and the Franks took it at the time, right? Anyway, so what happened next, which is the topic this time, certain events happened in Egypt that is going to change yani, the map of, of the world here. And it's, uh, this episode, if you will, is one of my favorite. It's action-packed, if you will, a little bit. You'll see a lot of action happening, but it also has a lot of surprises, which is very interesting. So what happened in Egypt, there was a wazir that came to power, right? As usual, he takes power of the country, and another wazir revolted against him, right, and uh, took power. But he did not succeed in killing him. This wazir that escaped with his life, his name is Shawar, he did something really out of the book. What did he do? He, he ran, fled from Egypt, and he went to Nur al-Din Zinki. And then he made a plea to Nur al-Din Zinki, and I think that's where we stop. What did he tell him? He told him the following. Look. Egypt is a very powerful country. Egypt is uh, it's very rich, right? It's a big country. And you're fighting the Crusaders from the north. If you put me back in power in Egypt, I promise I will be loyal to you. 
I promise to give you one third of the resources of Egypt. I promise to be loyal to you. You attack them from the north. I attack them from the south. We have a treaty, right? Help put me back in power. And we said, Nur al-Din Zinki, his response was what? He was like, this is out of the question, right? And you can see why from a strategical perspective. You want me to send some of my forces in Egypt. The Crusaders exist between both of us. Egypt is a huge country. It's a huge risk. It was a man, the top commander in the, in the army of Nur al-Din Zinki, a very famous warrior, a very famous general. His name is Asad al-Din, you know, the Lion of Islam. And it was really a name. The Franks feared this guy. He fought so well, he was known. He's one of the most powerful soldiers of uh, Nur al-Din Zinki. So Asad al-Din came to him and told him, you know what? Please, we cannot lose Egypt. I promise you, allow me to, to pick the top 3,000 knights in your army. Just give me 3,000 people, knights. And I promise you, just with 3,000 knights, I will be able to go and I will put this man back in power and I will bring Egypt to us so that we're united. And he kept at it, kept at it till finally Nur al-Din Zinki agrees. And now what happens next? Now, this is very interesting. Asad al-Din picks the top 3,000 knights and soldiers. And those names are going to stay with us. So some of them, right, some of the list, uh, Al-Faqih Isa Al-Hikari. Why am I mentioning them? Remember, it's about the generation of Salah al-Din. Notice Al-Faqih Isa Al-Hikari. Faqih, this is a scholar that uh, studied in the Nizamiya school. Full Faqih, but he decided to, to become a knight. So he used one of the very famous things about him. He used to wear the helmet and the turban on it. You know, it's like a kind of the, the, the fighting imam of the army. So that is not only a, a most yani, powerful knight, but his existence represents what scholarship, right? So it's very important to have a man like him in, in this force because he knows what he's going to do, as you'll see. It's not only going to be a, a fighting knight, but he has ilm with him, right? So he picked al-Faqih Isa al-Hikari. Notice the word Hikari. Hikari, remember, the tribe of Hikar, those were Kurds that were bandits and cut roads. And we said this, Sheikh Adi ibn Musafir went there, established some kind of a school, and the entire region. Now you start seeing those people. So that's a student of Al-Adi ibn Musafir. Simply, Saif al-Din al-Mashtub al-Hikari. Another Hikari, right? Uh, one of the other interesting things I'll point out here, again, a lesson for us. He insisted. I have to take my nephew with me. Your nephew is young, is a young man, Yusuf, 28 years old, not a formidable knight or anything. He's, and he was, yeah, and he's, he's a good Muslim, but back in the day he used to have bad habits, he used to drink and what have you, and, and he's trying to reform his nephew. And what I'm telling you here is important. You see how they develop each other. So he insisted, my nephew, nothing will benefit him more than this. I want him to join this force. I want him to become, I want him to see real life. I want him to see what it's about. I want him to learn from men. So he insisted among those elite warriors, elite, you know, my nephew is going to be there too, this young man, right? So that he would learn something. And the, the mission started. Uh, go ahead. So this is now going to be called the race to the Nile. Just go ahead. So one more. So here is what happened. Nur al-Din Zinki gathered his forces and started attacking different cities in the areas of Sham to create what? A divergence. So the Franks now are focused, where is Nur al-Din Zinki going, right? Where is he going to attack? So all their eyes now are focused on where, where is he going? While, while this is going on, he ordered Asad al-Din to take those 3,000 knights, no foot soldiers, ride their horses, and full gallop. You know, like just gallop with the horses. All the way south, cross the Sinai, with shower, right, and go to Egypt with full flank. And subhanAllah, this is exactly what happened. And Asad al-Din succeeded in going to Egypt. He took the city of Bilbais, which is on the eastern, eastern border, and with the help of shower, got some people from there, attacked the city of Cairo, and with 3,000 knights, he was able to defeat the Egyptian army and put shower back in power, which is 3,000 warriors defeated the entire army of Egypt, which tells you where Egypt was in the day, Versus Nur al-Din Zinki, right? It was like a big gap here, right? And then Shawar now is in power, so they, it succeeded. So things are good, you know. I put you back in power. Things look good. I fulfilled my promise. And uh, uh, Asad al-Din left, returned back to the city of Bilbais, and something happened. 
What do you think Shower did at this point? Like the, this minister? So he was, I said, the deen is in Bilbais. He's telling, okay, we have an agreement. And he said, what agreement? There's no agreement. He said, what do you mean? He said, you have to leave. Leave before I come and I'll come. You know, I have Egypt with me right now. You'd better leave before or else. And this is Asad al-Din Shirko. So this is a man of... So he said, I'm not leaving. I'm staying in Bilbais. And, I'm not, and if you do, I'm going to attack. What do you think happened next? Any guess? Who Shawar did what? He's afraid from Asad al-Din. This is really a powerful commander. So who should I use? He contacted the Franks and said, listen, this is a golden opportunity. You have only 3,000 knights in Egypt between me and you. They're trapped in this small city, Bilbao, very small city. Golden opportunity. So you come help me, and I'm going to give you the following. All expenses paid for. I'm going to pay for you to do this. Second, I'm going to give gifts to all the soldiers that come, and I'm going to pay tribute to you. Right? And help me, and it's a golden opportunity, because, you know, now you take care of him. Uh, Nur al-Din Zinki was defeated before. It's a, it's a good deal. And you can guess what happened. Right. <clears throat> the Franks, of course, this was a golden opportunity for them. Uh, he's inviting them to Egypt. He's going to give money. They get rid of, rid of Asad al-Din Shirko. That's, and they came. They rode and they went all the way and they started surrounding the city of Bilbis. Bilbis is a very small city. And uh, Ibn al-Athir says the walls are very like, you know, this is not very well fortified. So for them, this was not going to take maybe a few days. You have the Franks and you have the Egyptians and Asad al-Din is in that city trapped. We're going to get rid of it. What do you think Asad al-Din did? This is night. He contacted Nur al-Din Zik. How? He texted him. <laughs> he sent a text to Nur al-Din Zink. How did he send the text? Yes, exactly. He used Pigeon Express. <laughs> so that, that was, again, a Muslim invention of the time. The Franks did not know that. Whenever you have an army, uh, you know they raise, they raise pigeons. And one interesting thing about those pigeons, if they, if they are born in a certain place, you take them anywhere, you leave them, they'll fly back to where they're born. So they had pigeons from each city. This pigeon is from Damascus, it's, you know. So if you want to send a letter to Nur al-Din, you get the pigeons, write the letter, and that's exactly what he did. He quickly used one of those pigeons, dispatched a, a letter to Nur al-Din Zinki telling him, we've been betrayed, which is the nightmare of Nur al-Din. That's exactly why Nur al-Din Zinki did not want this to happen. Because he realized those are not to be trusted, the Ismailis, right? The Franks are in the middle, now what? You're trapped in Egypt, what should I do? Right? So he sent, a, and he told him, I'm not surrendering, I'm not giving up. I'm still in Bilbais, and I'm going to fight. So he did not run away. And, and, but I'm surrounded. Now, Nur al-Din Zinki receives this news. And Nur al-Din Zinki was so distressed. Those are the top 3,000 soldiers and knights I have. And they've been betrayed, and they're in Egypt. What can I do? So he started, go on more. He started, uh, he started attacking the Franks in Shem. Why? He's trying to put pressure on them. If you guys don't leave, I'm attacking your cities, right? He's trying, he's doing his best. So one thing that he did was what? He took the means, he took action. He did not sit back and just make dua. And, no, no, he took actions. He went, he ordered his command, commanders and go and attack. But on the second thing, one thing that we know from Nur al-Din Zinki, and it's good for us now to know this, he did the following. That was a habit of his. Once he heard this news, he started fasting. He started, why? The Prophet وسلم, said, a person who's fasting, if you fast and you make dua, at the time, this dua is not, Allah is going to respond to. And it shows you where his heart was. So he, since this problem started, he fasted every single day with the intention of what? Ya Rabbi, I'm fasting. And every time I'm breaking my fast, it's, I don't know how we'll save them. He raises his hands and makes dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It tells you about the nature of who Nur al-Din Zinki was. Right? Once that happened, the Franks in Sham said, this is a golden opportunity. Nur al-Din Zinki has been defeated before. The top 3,000 knights are isolated in Egypt. So they gathered all their forces together. They sent to the kingdom of Jerusalem, Tripoli, Antioch, gather all the armies. Let's deal with Nur al-Din. Let's, let's make one big battle 
Maybe we can break Nur al-Din Zengi once and for all. So they gathered all the forces they can. And Nur al-Din Zengi realized what's going on. This is one big battle. If he loses this battle, both Egypt and Sham are jeopardized. So Nur al-Din orders all his forces to gather together. And the two armies meet near a city called Harim in Sham. And they describe Nur al-Din Zengi that night. He spends the entire night in Qiyam. And by the way, soldiers were the same. The camp of Nur al-Din Zengi spending the night raising their hands and salah, you know, salah and Qiyam and Tahajjud and Quran and Dhikr and Dua. And he spent the entire night raising his hands. Of the Dua that he said, he said the following. Dear Lord, Dear Lord, those, those are your servants, the Muslims. And those are your servants too, the Franks. But those are your friends. Those are the ones that the Muslims. And those are your enemies. Grant victory to the ones that are loyal to you. To the ones that say, La ilaha illallah, over those oppressors. Those who do not believe properly in you. He said many other adayas that I'll tell you about later. right? And the morning came. And the battle started. One of the most ferocious battles, the battle that's called the Battle of Hiram, when Nur al-Din Zinki succeeds in luring the Franks in, surrounding them, and it is said Allah granted not just a victory, a major victory for Nur al-Din Zinki. Not only the Franks were defeated, he actually captured some of their umara, some of their leaders, you know, some of their head figures, he captured them. Right? They fell to Nur al-Din Zinki. Once that happened, he immediately sent, he sent some of you know, his knights with some of the you know, captured flags and what have you to Asad al-Din and sent him letters. Why? He wanted to inform the Franks in Egypt. You're defeated and your countries are open to me. You'd better leave Egypt, right? And he immediately sent that to, to, you know, to Egypt. And the news came to Egypt and it is said, Ibn al-Athir writes, he said one of the most amazing things that Asad al-Din could stay in the city of Bilbais for two weeks and the armies of Egypt, and the Franks could not take the city from him. And the reason he's saying that's amazing, he's saying this is a very small city. The walls are not that, it's not very well fortified. Everybody thought it's like just a day or two. Yet this man stayed inside, they could not do anything, and he has only 3,000 people. And there is a reason, you can see the quality of the people I'm speaking about. The different, remember the first time, the second time I was to just fled away. You see the difference? Those are not the same type of men. Right? By the way, one of the things we know about this force on their way to Egypt, we know that from our books. Faqih Is al Hikari had some books of Aqidah. And along the way, what was he doing? He was teaching the whole army. They were going, oh, so they're fighting. But while they're fighting, while they're in this critical mission, that does not mean you stop learning. You learn even in the battlefield. So he had Aqidah classes throughout the mission. No matter what happens in the morning, night time, after Fajr time, guess what? We sit, here is the book, we learn. It tells you also about, do you understand the power, they call it state learning, by the way. What, I don't know if you know this concept, state learning, what is state learning? Let's say I want to teach uh, about anger management, right, anger control. So I can give a class, you sit here, let's, how do you control your anger? Good. What's the best way to, to teach anger management? When you're angry, the best time to teach anger is when you feel really angry and a person comes and you're angry, right? Here is what you need to do. It's called state because you're in that state and the knowledge comes to you in that state. So when they are in a state of distress and they were in a state of meeting an, uh, an, uh, yani an army that much bigger and you teach about tawakkul, how do you think that lands in their heart? That is an experiential level of learning that actually is... And that's exactly, if you remember, why Asad al-Din wanted his nephew to come. This is what's going to change. In state learning. Learn while you're doing something. Learn while you're being active. Learn on the ground. Not sitting back, you know, it's, it's good. It's good to learn. Go sit back, watch YouTube videos on your bed. Alhamdulillah, please do that. But they're not the same. It's not the same. Somebody learning in, in, the, you know, in your room. And somebody learning in a masjid. And somebody learning in the front line. They're different. If you go with a sheikh while he's doing da'wah and sit beside him while he's, you will learn differently than a lecture. Right? So that's an, a very important concept. 
طيب خير the message reaches uh, يعني أسد الدين and now guess what happens the Franks are very disturbed we've been defeated نور الدين زنكي our cities we need to leave who took an opportunity of this shower took the opportunity said great great news right here is the deal he went to Asad al-Din and told him, listen, you're surrounded. I mean, it's a hopeless situation. Uh, so it's good for you to yani, save yourself and your army. Uh, I will, I, I'll make a deal with you. So he made a deal with both parties. For the Franks, he said, I'll give you money. You leave. Go back, rescue your cities from Nur al-Din Zink. Asad al-Din, I'm going to spare you. We'll open the gates. We'll allow you to leave too. You know what happened? Do you see the idea? He used Asad al-Din Shirko to put himself power in power. He used the Franks to neutralize Asad al-Din. Both parties leave Egypt, and who stays in Egypt? Him. You see the idea? And that's exactly what happened. He made a deal with them, and it's, it's, Ibn al-Athir describes the situation. He says, they, they, uh, because the, the, the Muslims were afraid, the Franks betrayed. Right? So they made this deal, and they opened the doors. And it said, uh, according to Ibn al-Athir, Asad al-Din is himself holding his sword and his forces are coming out. And it is said some of the Franks went to Asad al-Din Shirko, right? Some of the Frankish soldiers said, aren't you afraid? You're coming out of this fort and we're so many around you. Aren't you afraid that we will betray and we'll attack you and we'll finish all of you? And the response from Asad al-Din to that man, Ibn al-Athir reports, he says, I wish you would. <laughs> because if you will, I would attack you with everything. I do, don't think I wanted to leave. I only decided to leave because everybody else in my army told me to do so. My opinion was not to leave, to stay here and fight you to the end. So if you do that, that's exactly what I want. And we will attack you. And one of us will kill ten of you. And then there will be nothing left to save Shem and Nur al-Din Zinki. We'll take Shem, and then after that we'll take Egypt. And that man responds, now I understand why my friends are afraid of you, right? But I want you to notice something. Those words, sometimes you, 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 you know, you, you read about Khalid ibn Walid, uh, you, you read about the companions, and their words are very powerful, right? And when they say it, it shakes the heart of people in front of them. Sometimes we are so happy, we take the same words, and we try to use them ourselves. And when we do so, people laugh at us. Why? I'm not Asad al -Din. I don't have his heart. I don't have his state. It's not about, oh, look at, I'll be like Asad al -Din. I'll go on, online. Behind, because now this is how people fight. You know, Asad of Islam, 165, right? You don't know who that is. And he comes and he just like, lets you have it. Islam is this and gives you great quotes. People would laugh at you. But when it comes from a man like Asad al -Din and he says a word like that, it, the state is hal shows. So people were terrified of him, right? And exactly, they left him, and the forces of Nur al-Din Zinki leaves Egypt, the Franks leave Egypt, and what happens? Showers in power again, right? Go ahead. <coughs> One more, right? So what happened? Nur al-Din Zinki was so happy that Asad al-Din came back, and he said, that's it, alhamdulillah, don't speak about Egypt again, right? And Asad al-Din was so upset, and he saw, he told him, Egypt is so weak. I've, I've seen what's going on there. I see their soldiers. This country, the, the Franks, and the Franks saw how weak they are. They're going to come back. It will fall in their hands. We can't let that happen. I have to go back. And Nur al-Din was like, no, that's crazy. Now you don't even have a support of anybody. No, right? Besides, Shawar made an agreement with the Franks, a joint uh, treaty, you know, so that to, to defend Egypt together against the, the enemy, which is Nur al-Din in that case, right? But Again, the same story. He insisted, 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 till finally Nur al-Din Zinki agreed. Same story happens. He gathers the three, his 3,000 knights, right? Same way, go ahead, right? So, hui, hui. so and uh, yeah, so go back. So, uh, uh, and the same thing, Nur al-Din Zinki starts attacking, and Asad al-Din full gallop with his forces. This time he wants to do what? Take Cairo, remove shower, right? Take it for us, right? And he the same, he knows what to do now. And he starts full gallop, and in Sinai, and this unexpected event happened. Go forward. They were met with a sandstorm. I don't know if, do you know what a sandstorm is? If if this is a disaster. Sandstorm, you can't see anything. It's a storm of sand. People die because it's a desert. You can lose your mounts. 
it changes the, the if you have sand dunes they change you can get disoriented it's very very serious and they met a sand you know sandstorm so they le lost so many of their mounts lost so much of their you know zed and you know some of their supplies they got lost but it delayed them you cannot they had to stay put together till the sandstorm gets over meanwhile who got news of this shower got some news that you know Assad al is come so he sent to the Franks, telling them, you know what, what we feared of is happening. He's coming to me. You don't want Nur al-Din Zenki to take Cairo, do you? No. So what do you suggest? Bring your forces so that we can stand and defeat. And again, I'm going to pay for you. And what happens? Go one more. So the Franks came and they did not go through the Sinai. They went through the, you know, the Mediterranean path so to avoid any sandstorms another way. And they went in front of the city of Cairo. And they put their armies, you know, the Franks' armies, and you know, the Egyptians and the Franks together, waiting for who? Asad al-Din is going to show up. 3,000 knights, we have our armies, Cairo is behind, and we'll just get rid of him immediately. They wait, they wait, they wait, nothing. Asad al-Din is not to be found anywhere. No news where this man is. And they wait, and it's getting longer and longer, and Asad al-Din is not even there. And he did something really yani, out of the book also. One more. So he went south to Egypt, right? Crossed the River Nile and appeared on the other side of Cairo <laughs> with the river in between of them, right? Between like him and... And then he sent a letter to Shaur and telling him the following, look, forget the past. It's a golden opportunity. The Franks are trapped between both of us. I'm from one side, you're from the other side. Let's finish them off. And we'll have our previous agreement. So he sent a messenger to, to Shawar telling him this. The response of Shawar was something like really very hideous. He beheaded the messenger of Asad al -Din. He killed the Muslim. And you know messengers should not be beheaded. So he cut his head and he sent his head with the message to the Franks. Telling them, look, Nur al-Din is trying to like, no, 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 I'm loyal to you. I, do you think that that's going to impress anybody? If you can betray Muslims. But it tells you like how, yeah, those, those are the things that again Salah al-Din and Nur al-Din had to deal with. Not only the Franks, look at, the, it, this is the hurdle. This is the hurdle, this man, what are you doing, right? So uh, they decided like, no, we're going to fight you. So Asad al-Din does what? He starts, go, go ahead one more. So Asad al-Din disappears. Where did he go? Apparently he started going all the way south. Go ahead. No, no, go, go back, sorry. Yeah, well, yeah. So he goes all the way south, right? And then he, he, uh, there is a, a very small village called Al-Babain, south of Egypt. He gathers his forces. 3,000 says, what do you think we should do? And so many of them said, listen, we are only 3,000. So we suggest you cross the river. You go to the other side. And uh, at least that way, if we, if we probably going to get defeated, Maybe we have a, ch a chance, maybe we can, some of us can escape to Nur al-Din Or maybe we should just go back. Asad al-Din's response was, he asked some of his commanders, like al Faqih Isa al -Hikay, what do you say? And the response was the following. Said, whomever is afraid of death should not serve under Nur al-Din Zinki. Nur al-Din Zinki takes very good care of all of us. You want to return back to Nur al-Din Zinki, telling him, that you delivered a country like Egypt to the Crusaders without even a fight, that will never be. We stay here and we'll do our best. When Asad al-Din heard this, he said, yani, Bismillah, this is exactly what I needed to hear. This is what we're going to do. Have glad tidings, I have a plan. And we will be victorious in this unimaginable battle with 3,000 against both armies. He said, I know what they're going to do. They know I'm with this army. So once they see my flag, they're going to concentrate all their attack on this flag because they want to get rid of me. So he gave his flag to his nephew, Yusuf, this young guy, the unexperienced, said, you take this task, take the flag. He said, pretend to be like me. And they're going to attack you. I don't want you to attack back. Appear that you're retreating. Keep moving back and keep running. When they will see you running, they will, they will come after you. And then he ordered his commanders, you know, the toughest on both sides. It's the pincher movement. And that's exactly what happened. The battle starts. They immediately see the flag of, you know, Asad al-Din. 
all forces attack. Yusuf starts retreating, right? They, uh, they follow, and from both sides, he attacks from both sides, and Allah grants victory to 3,000 people against the Franks. And again, Ibn al-Athir says, وَهَذَا مِنْ أَعْجَبْ مَا يُؤَرَّخْ And this is one of the most amazing things I'm writing down about. The 3,000 knights defeat the joint armies of the Franks in Egypt in that battle, right? But it, again, I want you to, I'm saying that for a reason, right? Those are not the same men. It's not, you see, this is not Salah al-Din and it's not Nur al-Din Zinki. It's those people, their determination, their strength. They know what they're doing, right? But then after the battle, what happens? So the, the, the defeated armies go, go back. Okay, he's going to take Cairo now. So they go and they, they, they stand in front of Cairo trying to protect the capital. Where is Asad al-Din? Nowhere to be found. Where does he go? Right? Go one more. He decides to go to the city of Alexandria. Now, why was that? Something really interesting. Alexandria was one place where some of the Sunni scholars still existed in Egypt. Remember, Cairo was an Ismaili thing. You have Al-Azhar there, it's dominated. The remnants of the Sunni scholars of Egypt were centered in Alexandria. And you had great scholars there, like Al-Hafid al-Sulafi, one great Hadith scholars, uh, Tahir ibn Awf al-Askandarani, a great Maliki scholar of the time, they were in Alexandria. Nur al-Din Zinki was in contact with them. Do you see what's going on? And not only that, open the gates. I said, it didn't strap, open the gates for him. Scholars had a say. So they asked people to do that. They open the gates. They go in, take care of, you know, the whatever is left of the Ismailis there, you know, protecting the city. And now Asad al-Din has the city of Alexandria. Now, why is that? You can see the, the coast, right? Maybe through the sea. So what happens next is what? The Franks are very disturbed. So go on more. They go and they start doing what? Let's surround them in that city. So they sent to their fleet to come from, you know, Jerusalem. And they surrounded the city of Alexandria from all places. And then you had the same situation again. This time, instead of Bilbao, it's in Alexandria. Asad al-Din surrounded with 3,000. He sent again Pigeon Express to Nur al-Din. Help, right? <laughs> same story. Nur al-Din Zinki, you can see same story. Starts fasting, gathers his forces, starts attacking, right? But this time, something interesting happened. Go on more. Uh, Asad al-Din does something interesting. He takes 300 of his knights, not 3,000, 300. And he did something really interesting. He said, open the doors of Alexandria, and he starts charging with 300 knights. And he was, his intent was not to attack, was to penetrate. He penetrated the siege and went all the way south with just 300 knights. What are you going to do with 300 knights? If you will, a revolt. He started, he has, uh, you know, Faqih Isa al-Hikari, which is a scholar, start speaking to the Egyptian people. Start promoting our cause. Start telling them, what is this? Start telling about the true message of Islam. Start doing what? Bring problems for shower. And riots started to happen all, you know, Egypt in the south. People are now revolting and shower has now a problem. It's not, a, this guy's causing havoc. So what does he do? Same story. Sends a letter. Sends a letter to Asad al-Din and a letter to the Franks. The situation is not good anymore. You guys just got defeated. Nur al-Din Zink is attacking. Asad al-Din, it's useless. You're, you're trapped. Same deal. Let's come to an agreement. The Franks return. And this time, I'm going to pay you one million dinar. And I'm going to allow you to have some of your soldiers inside the city of Cairo. Which for them was like really big, right? And Asad al-Din, you'll be allowed to leave Egypt safely. Despite the opinion of Asad al-Din, Nur al-Din Zinki agreed to the agreement. And guess what happened? They had one condition. Uh, yani, Asad al-Din said, the people that helps us in the city of Alexandria, those scholars, leave them alone. And they signed the agreement. Same story. The Franks leave. Asad al-Din leave. And Shawar is back again in Egypt. The one. <clears throat> right? And the situation was getting worse. Now the Franks have people inside Cairo. And Asad al-Din tells Nur al-Din, they're going to take the city. Now they have people inside the, the city of Cairo. It's, it's a matter of time. And what he predicted happened. Those people sent to, to Amuri, which is Jerusalem, you know, the, the, the king of Jerusalem, telling him Cairo is really weak. The Egyptians are really weak. Send your forces. And we're from inside. We open the gates. We're done. 
and the Franks decide actually to do that. Egypt is weak enough, and he had a new batch of knights coming from Europe, fresh batch, eager to fight. Let's go, let's go for Egypt one more time. And go ahead. So they leave, and they go, and they meet the small city of Bilbais again. And what do they do? This is, again, Asad al-Din is not there to protect the city. They take it in one day. They attack the city of Bilbais, they took the city. Something bad happened, but it was also, subhanAllah, there is some goodness in it. Once they took the city of Bilbais, those newcomers from Europe, the new knights, did not spare anybody. Killed every man, woman, and children. Nobody spared. But when they did that, it was terrible. They, it's a massacre. But there was one good thing in it. What do you think that was? The Egyptian people realized what? They got upset, one, two. There is no way to surrender to those people. Surrender is out of the question. There is no choice of surrender. They'll kill everybody. So which means what? We have to fight. Right? So Shawar ordered, you know, some of the yani, Cairo's district to be burned. You know, everybody gathers within the wall. And here is something interesting that happened. The Ismaili Khalifa, which is again a puppet at this time, he's just sitting, doing nothing, sends a letter to Nuruddin Zengi. And the letter was very interesting. He sent the letter and he sent some flock of hair of his own wives. And he was telling Nuruddin Zinki the following. I'm sending this letter to you. And in it, there are some hairs from, you know, the hair of my own wives. And they are seeking refuge into you from the fate that's going to befall them if the Franks take the city of Cairo. Come and please help. And I promise you, if you come this time, we will get rid of shower and I will give you the city. You can have a minister, you can assign, you can put Asad al-Din as a minister. And again, that was, uh, Nur al-Din could not ignore this. So this time, he commanded Asad al-Din, not 3,000 knights, take the army. Take a full army to Egypt. Egypt is going to fall, we are not going to let that happen. And Asad al-Din responds, moves with a huge army, like to Egypt. Go one more, right? <coughs> The Franks were trying to surround Cairo and they hear about what's going on. They could not take the city of Cairo. Now the Muslims are coming. I said, they did not with 3,000 knights. It's a full force. You know, it's a hopeless situation. What do they do? They got scared. And what did they decide to do? Go ahead. They left their position. They did not even stay to fight I said, they, they realized they're surrounded. And they left Egypt. And they returned from where they came. Once Asad al-Din came to the city of Cairo, it was clear what's going to happen. He went to the city, opened the gates, they captured Shawar, they ordered him, the, the Ismaili Khalifa himself ordered him to be beheaded, the traitor for all what he did, they got rid of him. But now who's the wazir of Egypt? The deal was Asad al-Din. So Asad al-Din became the wazir of Egypt. Right? Go ahead. So now you have a very powerful commander of Nuruddin Zinki in, remember Cairo is still under the Ismaili Khilaf. But now you have a very powerful man in the, in the Wizara of Egypt, right? Here is the interesting part. Two months later, Asad al-Din dies. We don't know if it's an assassin or not. I don't think it's an assassin. Natural death. And people, like you know, scholars say, subhanAllah, after all this, after all what he did, just two months, and then he passes away. Something really interesting happens. Okay, he passes away. Who's the next wazir? So the Khalifa had a very interesting idea. He said, okay, that's a good opportunity. Let me put the weakest of his men so I can control him. Let's not put al faqih Isa al-Hikari or Shahab al-Din al-Harimi or... No, no, no. The nephew, this Yusuf thing, 28 years old, come. He brought him to the palace and said, I have good news for you. I'm assigning you to be a Nasir. Give him a title, right? My was here of Egypt, right? And now you are in power. Because he knew once that will happen, his friends are going to what dispute? They're going to fight. They're not going to agree. And they're going to fight among each other. And that's a way to control things. You see, it's going to create a fitness. They're not going to follow him. They fight among each other. Great. And here comes to power. Yusuf, Ibn Najm din Ibn Shadi, Ibn Ayyub known as Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi. That's Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi. Yusuf is Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi. This 28 years man that did not want power, did not even, was not interested to fight, was not interested, 
was then minding his own business, you know. <laughs> but Asad al-Din Shirko is the one that in, he insisted. And he said it you know, in his own biography. He says, whenever he, my uncle used to come to me, I hated going, especially after what happened in Alexandria. And he left, it was so terrible. So the third time when he told me to come with him, I tried to delay, but he insisted. And he went to Nur al-Din and Nur al-Din Zinki forced me to go. He has no aspiration. He was not interested in power at all, right? And subhanAllah, he picked him. See, I'm Kuruna, I'm Kuruna. Why was he picked? He thought, I'm picking the weakest among them so I can control him. You picked Salah al -Din. <laughs> You see the, the irony of Allah subhanAllah. Like, subhanAllah, I'm Kuruna, I'm Kuruna. Look at how people plot and how Allah plots. Didn't you pick anybody else? You picked the most capable person among them. But nobody knew that yet. Once he was picked, what Al Khalifa expected happened. Immediately, every the, the elderly started differing. No way! Yusuf, 28? No, 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 no. We can't follow him. He doesn't know anything. He's a young man. And we have great people here, right? So, no, no, no. And they started fighting, which is what was the Khalifa wanted, remember? Who saved the day? Al Faqih Isa Al Hikari, being a man of knowledge. A man of ilm, knowing that it's not about status and it's not about a man. It's about he's young, but we're all here. And there's the concept of shura and there's the concept of unity. Unite. It doesn't matter who leads. Don't feel this arrogance. I serve under him. Doesn't matter who you serve under. You can serve under an 18 years old if you're told so. That's a part of Taskeya, you know. So because people felt this as a kid. We're teaching him. How can he be my superior? But al faqih Isa al went to one of one after the other till he convinced everybody to unite behind Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi. Right? And Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi now comes to power in Egypt. One more. <coughs> so, uh, okay. so now we have this situation. You have Nur al-Din Zinki in Sham. You have Egypt with Salah al-Din, but the Ismaili Khalifa is there. And you have some, he has some problems there. You have the Egyptian army not loyal to him. You have the Ismailis. You have the assassins. The country is not yet under his grip. So it was a very delicate situation. He kept some of the soldiers of you know, Nur al-Din, including al faqih Isa al-Hikari, you know, those 3,000 knights with him as the base of his force. right? But it was unstable. And indeed, there were revolts against Salah al-Din. The first was the Egyptian army revolted against him. And a battle happened between the Egyptian army and the forces of Salah al-Din in which he finally and put down that, that fitna, if you will, right? But the reason I'm saying this, same story. If you get Salah al-Din today, same thing will happen. I don't think we will accept him, right? And this is what happened to him. Continue one more. Some, some about the, the characteristics of this man, Salah al-Din al-Ayubi, and then we'll say more as we go along, but at least, so, very similar to Nur al-Din Zinki. He was raised in the time of Nur al-Din Zinki. He was raised in the schools that Nur al-Din Zinki yani, developed. He, one of his teachers was Al-Hafid ibn Asik. And as such, he loved the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa He loved the ilm of hadith in particular, right? He was very similar to Nur al-Din. They say there is one difference. You know, Nur al-Din Zinki is a very serious man, follows sharia, uh, very yani, humble, uh, is not interested in money, very generous, uh, very careful not to say any foul word always worship in, uh, in jama'ah, always uh, praise all the sunnah, and Salah al-Din similar in everything. They say, but there was one other characteristic of Salah al-Din, very soft heart. See, this, this, his personality was a very soft heart. And they describe to the extent, if he hears the Quran, anytime he hears the Quran recited, he would stop and you can see him crying. His heart was so soft that you recite Quran in front of Salah al-Din, he'll pause and he starts crying in front of you, right? He always helped the weak people. He had a, any woman that needs help, any elderly person, any kid that needs help. He was always there to help those people. He would, even they would describe, he would be walking, he sees a, a young kid, you know, uh, reciting a surah of, of the Quran. He would stop, bring me his dad. Oh, his dad passed away. Okay, I'll spend on him. Get, get him make him a scholar. He was very, very generous, very, very gentle. Um, very clement. Meaning what? His patience, as you will see, his ability to control his anger is phenomenal. And you will see, like, you know, like, you can, he does not get angry easily. This was known about Salah al-Din. You can do whatever. Salah al-Din is very calm. Very difficult to get him really upset, right? Very much in control of his anger. 
uh, his determination and bravery, as you'll see, is phenomenal. And you'll see, like, I, we'll see it in, in, in the, the following, you know, lectures, inshallah. So, love of the Quran, love of Salah. He says towards the end of his life, it has been 40 years. I can't remember when was the last time I did not pray in Jama'ah. Meaning what? Fighting, there is always Jama'ah. He cannot remember one Salah he did not pray in Jama'ah. His love of hadith was so immense that, as I told you, Ibn Shaddad, one hadith scholar, he asked him to follow him in his battlefields because he wanted to learn about the Prophet wasallam every single day. And Ibn Shaddad would describe daytime his fighting, nighttime everybody sleeps, he brings Ibn Shaddad, open Sahih al-Bukhari, you know, go ahead. Explain hadith. One of the things he did, he was in Egypt, one of the first things he did, he went to the city of Alexandria. Why? Two things. Uh, uh, Tahir ibn Awf al-Iskandarani, the great Maliki scholar, is there. He wanted to take, you know, Muwatta al-Imam Malik? The, the Malikis have a book of hadith called the Muwatta, right? This is a book of hadith of Imam Malik. It's, it's yani, one of the books of hadith. He wanted to hear the book of hadith and have ijaza directly from that sheikh. So he takes all his children, all his family members, goes to Egypt, does what? Sit between the hands of the scholars, taking hadith. Uh, in... Uh, Sayyid Alam al one incident that shows you, like the, and, and again, the, those scholars. <coughs> See, uh, Salah al-Din is sitting with his brother and they're reading the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His brother leaned to him to tell him something. Just leaned, you know, to just... And Salah al-Din leaned back and they're, they're just whispering. And it is said, this, the scholar of the time, I think it was al-Hafid of the sulafi he said, stop. Stop meaning what? Like, do not continue reciting the hadith. Stop. And then he looked to the Salah al-Din and he said, Ishhada. Remember, this is the wazir of Egypt. He says, Ishhada, the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is being narrated and you guys are speaking? Ishhada, stop or I'll kick you both out of my session. Right? So he learned also the discipline of the, you know, the adab. So, for example, Salah al-Din, if, if anybody narrates the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he would stop. And he would ask you, please narrate with the isnad, the full isnad. So he had such a high respect of the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Of the things that he did in Egypt, he noticed Egypt is the infrastructure was terrible. So I'll give you examples. Uh, he noticed they have a very big prison. You know, tyrants, one of the, the things that they, they have a monumental prison, right? To just put everyone in. In that prison, they used to, anybody who's going for Hajj, for example, you pass by Egypt, you have to pay taxes. You don't pay taxes, you be thrown in prison. So Salah al-Din was like, this is, he demolished the whole prison, built a huge school for the Shafi'i Madhab. But he did something really interesting. He said, what? The people that are coming for Hajj, you take money from them? No. He built what he called Dar al He ordered through all the lands he owned in Egypt, hotels, free hotels. Anybody going to Mecca or Medina, you're passing by Egypt, you're our guest. Meaning what? Lodging, food, water, doctors, free on the state. So he replaced that. And it tells you his generosity. He abolished all taxes, which for Egyptians were unheard of, right? First thing he comes, no taxes, Egyptians were like. And he started giving Egyptians, you know, he's very generous. He started treating them nicely. So people started to love Salah al -Din. They never saw something like that. And they really loved the men around him. And his effort was not alone. All the men with Salah al -Din, if you see what they did in Egypt, schools, hospitals, uh, orphanage, uh, pharmacology, you know, like the, the medicine. They started building the infrastructure of Egypt. Nevertheless, while this was happening, go on more. Yeah. And by the way, those are some of the names, and we'll go through more of them. Yani. Those are some of the scholars and the knights around Salah al-Din al-Ayyub. Maybe I'll mention some of the, uh, we'll pick some random people here and there. So let's pick some of the knights. For example, uh, Hussein al-Din Lulu, right? This is the commander of the fleet of Salah al-Din. Salah al-Din noticed Egypt has the Red Sea and the Mediterranean Sea. At the time, Egypt didn't have a fleet of ships. So he started building ships to defend the Mediterranean and the Red Sea. The Red Sea was okay because it's under the Muslims, but the Mediterranean, there are the Franks, right? So the commander of the fleet was Hussein al-Din Lul. Hussein al-Din Lul, they tell you, this man, every single day, right? He would wake up in the morning, donate 10,000 loaves of bread. He had a bakery, right? So what would he do? He ordered his bakery, bread, 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 10,000, free to people. 
right? So that's uh, Hussein al -Din. Uh, You take uh, Taqiy al-Din. Taqiy al-Din, that's the nephew of Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi. And I want you to notice this. Asad al-Din, his uncle, treated him in such, he, yani, he groomed him, right? He did the same. He went to his own nephew, Taqiy al-Din, a young man, right? And he started dealing him in the same way. Those, this Taqiy al-Din is one of the most powerful knights of Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi. You will see him in the Battle of Hattin. You will see him in the conquering, conquering Jerusalem. He became one of the top leaders of Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi. Taqiy al-Din built two schools in Egypt, free for people, right? You have uh, Qaraqush is the one that, uh, this, this was an architect. He's the one that built the citadel in Egypt. The, the, he was a master in fortification, if you will, right? So the men around Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi were really, and again, I don't have enough time to tell you the biography of each one of those, right? Uh, of course, Al-Faqih Isa al-Hikari, you know, you know a little bit about this man, right? So they, he became the right hand of Salah al-Din al -Ayyubi. Salah al-Din owed so much to him. He learned a lot from him. So he became like his really right hand. Here, uh, some of the scholars you might know, like we said, Al-Hafz ibn Asakir ibn Qudam al-Maqdisi, very well known. Uh, you have Tahir ibn Awf al-Askandarani, like a bunch of scholars. Ibn Shaddad is the Hadith scholar that used to accompany him. Uh, Al-Wa'id ibn Najah, that's a student of uh, uh, Sheikh Abdul Qadir al-Jilani, that was, uh, he's an admonisher. And Salah al-Din liked him so much, to the extent he regularly, him and his family would attend. You know, admonishment is different than ilm. Admonishment is that which softens your heart. Tell me something to make me really, really worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Admonition, not just pure ilm, right? Okay, just go ahead. One more. Type. The challenges that Salah al-Din faced in Egypt was not small. You have external challenges. You have the Franks in Jerusalem. You have now the Franks in Europe. Europe is not happy that Egypt is going to be under Nur al-Din. You have the assassins too. Remember, the assassins are loyal to the Ismailis. Internally, you have the Ismaili Khilafah. You have the Egyptian army, which is not loyal to him. The, the, all the jurisprudence system is not under his control. Al-Azhar is theologically not a Sunni, a Sunni school of thought. You had revolutions. The economy and the infrastructure is broken. The citizens are so ignorant because of lack of ilm. So Salah al-Din faced internal challenges as well as external challenges. Right? One more. Uh, go ahead. So, I'm going to mention this. One of the things that uh, he feared happened, the Ismailis in Egypt was not happy that Salah al-Din is the wazir. So they decided to do what? Let's plot to retake the wazir. So they did the following. They plotted among each other to make a coup inside, you know, inside of Cairo and just take over, right? They contacted the assassins, get rid of Salah al-Din. Plus, they contacted the Franks, uh, you know, from Jerusalem, come and help us get rid of Salah al-Din and we will repay you. So now we had a plot of three prongs, right? That's happening against Salah al-Din. Right? Go ahead. Yeah, so go back, sorry. Go back. One more, right? So the good, uh, yani, uh, the good news is uh, the assassins attempt, they sent some of their people that pretended to be soldiers in the camp of Salah al-Din. Alhamdulillah, by the grace of Allah, there was one person in, in his, yani, uh, his emirs that recognized them. He saw them before. So he told Salah al-Din, step to the side, please. Right? Got some soldiers. And then he went to those soldiers and said, how dare you come to this army? And you know that I'm here and I know who you are. Once he said that, they just took off their swords. Of course, a fight happened. They got those assassins. Alhamdulillah, Salah al-Din was spared this attempt. So he was saved from that attempt to get rid of his life. Uh, of his life. The revolt within uh, the, 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 yani the city of Cairo, Al-Wa'id ibn Najm, this man that uh, was sent by uh, Sheikh Abdul Qadr al-Jilani years ago, he was in Egypt. He was, he pretended to be with them. Meaning what? He's just, a, you know, uh, this Sheikh that gives admonishment. He went to those people that are plotting against Salah al-Din and said, what are you doing? And they thought he's with us, with them. And he said, yeah, I'm interested. What are you doing? I can help you too. He trusts me. He said, really? Yeah, yeah, I'm with you. What are you going to give me if I help? And they trusted. So they start, you take this. We'll give you this. We'll take this. And he pretended to be with them. He got every single detail of what they're doing. Went back to Salah al-Din and told him every single name, what they're pl planning to do, and their plot. And Salah al-Din captured all of them. Right? So that plot was foiled. The one that struck Salah al-Din by surprise 
was the following. The soldiers in, in Cairo revolted against the Egyptian army, while in parallel, the city of Dumyat, right, which is a postal, you know, uh, uh, sorry, a portal city in Egypt, a huge fleet appeared. And the city was under siege by the Franks. So he had the revolt in Egypt, the Egyptian army, and the Franks attacking the city of Dumyat at the same time. And Salah al-Din sent some of his forces to defend the city of Dumyat and started fighting within the cities, within the city of Cairo against the Egyptian army. He sent to Nur al-Din Zinq, right? What happened here is something really interesting. It's the same pattern, Nur al-Din Zinq immediately, fasting day and night, right? Sending forces regularly to Salah al-Din and starting to attack the, 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 the crusaders or the Franks near Jerusalem, right? To just put pressure on them, right? And then he sends to all the commanders, all the cities, anybody who, ha who has an army, come join me. And Ibn al-Athir narrates one of those emirs. He says that. Uh, some of his people came and said, what are you going to do? Nur al-Din Zinki wants to send us to Egypt to help you know, with Salah al-Din. Are you really going to do this? He said, no, no, no. He said, Nur al-Din qad taqashaf. Wa huwa yulqi bi nafsihi ila al-mahal. That Nur al-Din became a, you know, a dry bone, basically, of fasting and praying all the night. And he throws himself in, in disasters. I have no plan whatsoever in doing this, yani this endeavor of his. I'm sitting in my place. He said, next day, his, his emirs come to the same man. And they see him putting his helmet, his armor. And said, what happened? Did you change your mind? He said, what can I do? Nur al-Din did something with me. I, 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 I couldn't help. Said, what did he do? He said, he sent letters to every scholar in my city telling them about what's happening, telling them how much he needs help, and telling them, help if you, if you can't, help with your dua, please. So he said, every single scholar, every single man in the city, they're reading the book of, of Nur al-Din. They're crying, making dua for Nur al-Din, and making dua against me. <laughs> and he said, if I don't go with him, they're going to remove me. <laughs> so I can't help it, right? I have to go. <laughs> but the reason I'm mentioning this is what? Do you see the relation with scholars? You see Nur al-Din, does not force people. They loved him. He won their heart. He made the cause so dear for them. He was backed up by people that was as determined as him, backed up by scholars, right? So battles raged, right? And Nur al-Din continued to fast, continues to fast. Something really interesting in the Athenian narrates, one of the shiuch of Nur al-Din Zinq. One night he sees a dream, and in the dream he sees the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and that sheikh was, yani, subhanallah, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa comes and tells him, I want you to go to Nur al-Din and tell him the situation with Salah al-Din is resolved. The Franks are defeated and their ships will sink and Salah al-Din wins. And he said, yeah, Prophet of Allah, he is not going to believe me. It's like, yani, it was one night. What? He, said, he said, tell him by the sign of the day of the battle of Hiram and he will understand what you're speaking about. So it is said the Sheikh wakes up, Salat al-Fajr, goes to the Masjid, Nur al-Din Zinki, of course, is there, and then he's sitting, and he describes, I, yani, he doesn't know how to start this, right? So Nur al-Din comes to him, looks at him, and tells him, should you say, or should I say? And the man paused, he said, you saw the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa And the man backed up, and he said, yes. He said, what did he tell you to tell me? And the man was, tells you who Nur al-Din Zinki is, right? It's righteousness, right? He said, yes, he told me, sir, he told me to tell you that don't worry about Egypt. Your dua, your fasting, Allah responded to you. The situation has been resolved. He said, that's not all what he said. He told, you told him something else. And he said, yes, I told him that you won't believe me. And he said, yes, and what did he tell you to tell me? He said, he said to mention by the dua of the day of Harim, and Nur al-Din started crying. So this sheikh said, yani, Sayyidi, what was that dua? What was that? He said, on the day of the battle of Hiram, remember? The battle when Asad al-Din was trapped and he spent the whole life. He said, of my dua, I raised my hands and said, Ya Allah, I am not worthy. I know I have so many sins. I know I am not worthy to ask you. But Ya Rabbi, do not bring victory to Nur al-Din. Who is Nur al-Din? This dog, Nur al-Din that deserves any victory from, but please, Ya Rabbi, give victory to the Muslims. Do not let them de be defeated because of any of my shortcomings. And he started crying, right? 
So that's how we know about this dua, by the way. Because how would you know except through that story, right? And indeed, what happened was something amazing. You read the books. They say that day, uh, Salah al-Din sends a fire-throwing equipment. I don't know what it is, to the city of Dumyan. Winds change. You know, the winds usually blow from, yani, from the Mediterranean inwards. That day, the wind shifted, and it was blowing outward. So when they, the, this fire throwing machine started throwing the fire, the fire went so far, it burned all the ships of the Crusaders. So the Dumyat was relieved. And Salah al-Din succeeded in yani, defeating the Egyptian army in the city of Dumyat. After that, Salah al-Din made the decision. The Egyptian army disbanded. We'll, we'll make a new army. This army, they're not loyal. He had to remake a new army in Egypt. Right? One more thing, and maybe we'll, I don't know if we can stop here. Go one more. One more. Uh, one more. I simply said all this. No. One thing that happened. Nur al-Din sent to Salah al-Din said, it's time. Time for what? It's time to abolish the Ismaili Khilaf. And on a Friday prayer, the Friday prayers in Egypt, they used to make dua for the Ismail Khilaf. Salah al-Din sent to all the Imams in the Masajid. This Friday prayer, the dua is going to be for the Abbasi Khilafah in, in, in Baghdad. Meaning what? I'm abolishing the Ismaili Khilafah from that day. And that was the end of the Ismailis in Egypt. That day, and everybody was like, is it going to be a revolt? And to his surprise, it took two years when people started making dua you know, for the Khilafah, the Abbasi Khilafah, and to Salah al-Din, none of the people. And he abolished the Ismaili Khilafah of Egypt. With it, he did the following. He went to Al-Azhar, and he abolished the Ismaili teachings. He returned Al-Azhar back to the Sunnis method. So the one that, Azhar today is a Sunni school of thought, as you know. The one that did that was Salah al-Din al -Ayyub. That was one of his achievements, right? He removed all the Ismaili judges, replaced them with Sunni judges, right? destroyed all the prisons, removed all the taxes. It was a new era. And at the time, Nur al-Din Zinki sent to him and said, that's it. You have Egypt now. I have Sham. The Franks are in the middle. It's time to go for Jerusalem. And Nur al-Din does something really interesting. He orders a pulpit to be designed. And he says, this is a pulpit that I'm going to put in the Aqsa Mosque when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives it back to us on our hands, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala return the Aqsa Mosque to our hands. Amen. Ya Rabbil Alameen. Right. Go one more and I think we'll stop here. Right. I, I, I think I will stop here. Of course, uh, one thing I will say, Salah al-Din's opinion was not yet. Uh, we cannot, Egypt is not in my hands. The Ismailis are still there. They're really upset that the Khilafah is gone and Egypt is not stable. Right? I can help you, but I, I have to build the infrastructure more. And he was right. Because while that was happening, there was another plot from the Ismailis to again abolish the rule of Salah al-Din in Egypt. Uh, next time, we're going to see uh, that. We're going to see something else, which is actually one of uh, what led to the Battle of Hattin, what led to the reconquering, reconquering of Jerusalem. The Franks are going to attempt to do something really unheard of. So now you have Shem with Nur al-Din, Egypt with Salah al-Din. What about Al-Hijaz? What about Mecca and Medina? Yeah, we're going to see the Franks will attempt to attack the city of Medina. The Franks made a plot to attack Medina and according to them, dig the grave of the Prophet and take his body out and return it to their own place. Hijaz was going to face an attack by the Franks. How will they react? What will Salah al-Din do, inshallah? How will this completely change the tide? That's inshallah what we see inshallah next time. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruk wa natubu ilayk wal asr inna al-insana fi khusr illa alladhina amanu wa 'amilus salihati wa tawassaw bil haqqi wa tawassaw bis-sabr. Jazakum Allah.